All right, everybody, we're back. I know if you notice, the applause are getting more and more, and that's because of all the followers that we have because these PowerPoint presentations are amazing. All right, um, we're moving on. We ended with the first Continental Congress meeting to basically uh, make the king happy, tell the king that they're still, you know, they're still with him, but at the same time, they are forming a militia. They've sent the militia to start being trained over in Boston, where, of course, the um, battles of Lexington and Concord took place. So, again, it was that highly outnumbered, small little group of militia soldiers, but it, it, gained, gr it gained ground as the soldiers were walking back to Boston. Now, now that the first shots of the war have rung out, so you have now the British have fired on their American colonists, in a way, it is kind of like a civil war. And to the rest of the world, now they're watching these American colonists trying to fight for independence. Now that, the, you know, the talk is over, you know, the writing for help is, is starting. Basically, you have, you know, a mini war, at least in Massachusetts. You have a war going on in the colony of Massachusetts. The other 12 are, are kind of jumping in. Some of them aren't. It's one of those things where you know, sides are being picked by all the different colonists. So what you have is you have a second Continental Congress called the first time that they met. They chose to stay peaceful and write letters to the king, but also prepare themselves for what could come. And in the second Continental Congress, which is called in May of 1775, the delegates, most of them all coming back, the 56 original ones, now all 13 colonies come. Georgia sends theirs as well. And now you have them all meeting once again in Philadelphia, to decide how to pay for and come up with an army and a navy and how they're going to pay for that. So going back to the French and Indian War, they had that chance with the Albany plan when they turned that down. But now that it's a war happening with them, where it's just them against the king and his soldiers and there's no king and soldiers helping you out, it's up to them now to, to pay for that. So when they decide that they are going to tax the colonists eventually and come up with money to pay for this and form their own army, it's voted on and it's passed because the colonists now know or the delegates now know that this war is it's gonna happen this war is happening right now as we speak in Massachusetts and they need to go all in and try to break away and form in, and form an independent country so what happens is first and foremost well, with this army that they're creating they need to appoint a commander they need to co appoint someone who knows what they're doing somebody who's ready to go to lead an army who has war experience and they look around in the room and one of the gentlemen from Virginia, one of the delegates from Virginia who's a very wealthy man who comes from money, his name is George Washington and old George is at the time wearing his French and Indian War uniform to in a way if you think about that just kinda think about that for a while why would he wear this uniform to this big meeting with all men full of really rich people that are well educated who are in their normal everyday nice outfits and then you have one man George Washington in his war uniform. All right, if you think it's just to show that he was ready to go to war, ready to break away, you get golf claps. Uh, George Washington, again, wore that uniform to pretty much show everybody, look, without talking, I know what I'm doing, I've done this before, I'm ready to lead. And sure enough, he is nominated by John Adams, cousin of Sam, and the group votes for him and he wins. Now the only man who really was trying to run against him is John Hancock, leader of the Sons of Liberty's from, or leader of the Sons of Liberty from Boston, but it's pretty easy that the vote goes towards George Washington because again, he has experience fighting in war and understanding how the British will fight as well. So he does get nominated and he leaves. He goes right away to Boston to help start collecting soldiers and then train them. Uh, Sam Adams and Patrick Henry again, the leaders of one of this group or of these groups and the Sons of Liberty. Sam Adams and Patrick Henry are guys who are asking now, sending letters to foreigners, foreign help, asking Spain and France and all these other groups, trying to say like, look, if we're going to war with the British, the biggest country in the world, the largest army, we need help. We can't do it on our own, even though the war will be here in America. We need outside help of people who don't like the British either. So it's just like kind of picking sides. You know, if you have a group of friends who are fighting with each other, you kind of pick your sides and you get the help you need. Same thing here with the Americans. They're trying to do the same thing. And again, you have most of the delegates still at this time of that big group of about 60, most of the delegates still do not want independence. They are not ready 
in the colonies to break away. Now, Massachusetts is kind of taking those steps, but most of the other colonies are not ready for that. For that. They are not part of this war really yet, but they are starting to talk about what could they do to keep the king, you know, from overstepping his bounds with them. And what they decide to do is they write an olive branch petition, which is basically just a letter to the king asking to avoid war. They're asking him for peace, and olive branch represents peace. And they, this Second Continental Congress sends this letter over. At the same time, they send it to Spain and, for, Spain and France asking for their support. So think about this realistically with you and your family. If you're fighting with your parents or maybe you got in a big argument with mom when you walked in the house today, dad's not home from work, you know, mom's mad at you, you've slammed the door in her face, you turn around as a 13 or 14 year old and you try to get dad's help. So right away when dad comes home without mom being able to tell the side of the story, you go right to dad and you tell dad, hey dad, I'm really sad and mom's really mad at me and I don't know what I did and you try to kind of get them to play against one another and that's what America's doing. They are sending a letter to the king saying, hey look, we're still your people. We love you. You're the best. But at the same time they send that letter to the king kind of trying to delay what's coming. They're sending letters to Spain and France and all these other countries asking them, hey look, we know you hate the English. Uh, can you help us in a battle for independence? Can you help us in this war for independence we might fight in? You know, you'll help beat the biggest, baddest country in the world who sort of, in a way, bullied you for years and years. Now, after this, this Continental Congress meets for months, Richard Henry Lee, who's pictured up here or painted up here in his saying, is the first congressman, he's from Virginia, he is the first congressman to actually outright call for a declaration to be made to be independent or break away from the country of England. So we can honor him in a way for being the guy who calls for this declaration of independence to happen. So good for Richard Henry Lee. Now at the same time this is all going on in the colonies, colonists are reading a pamphlet by a man named Thomas Paine. And Thomas Paine, is, his pamphlet is called Common Sense which as a group of teachers, we hope that you guys can develop during your time here at Ridge. We hope you do develop that common sense. So hopefully you're laughing a little bit at that. Uh, now the pamphlet of common sense basically told the colonists that if they use their own common sense, they would realize that they have products, they have crops that they're growing on the farms that could get them direct money. They don't need to ship them away to the king to pay money. That and it's not benefiting them to be part of England anymore. That, you know, with just what they're creating in the colonies, all these crops and everything else that they're creating, that they could be an independent country. They don't need the king anymore. And if they use their common sense, they would realize that. Now over 500,000 copies are sold. And basically it's, it's such a small pamphlet that you read it in a day or two and then you passed it on to a friend. So it doesn't look like many copies were sold. But again, it was something that was passed around pretty quickly. And again, when people read it, they came to the realization that America could and should be free. All right, when this Second Continental Congress meets, and there is a painting of them meeting in the Philadelphia State House, which we used to go visit, uh, they write a Declaration of Independence, which is very similar to a breakup letter in middle school. Now, the declaration is penned or written by a man named Thomas Jefferson as well as a, a couple others, Ben Franklin, a couple other guys helped, John Adams, a few other people. And there are four parts to the document. There is a preamble, which is an introductory statement, sort of like English class. Uh, a preamble is just an introduction saying what this is going to do, basically, that this letter is going to break them free of the king. Uh, the second part is a philosophy of government, which basically states that in America, the famous quote is that all men are created equal and have the rights the unalienable rights, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now basically this says that here in America that the people will govern themselves. Now again, this is a stretch. Most of the governments around the world had a king or a monarchy system, and we are now going to go back in time almost at least to say that we're going to set something up that like the Romans or the Greeks made, which was, you know, roughly 2,000 years ago. I know, that's pretty exciting. So, now we don't actually set up the government in this. We just say that we will. Because, again, we are not independent yet. We have to go to war and win that war. But that in our, in our system here in America, 
every person or every, all men will be created equal and have the, those rights, those unalienable rights that we kind of steal or plagiarize from John Locke. Uh, now the third part is why we separated from the king. And we basically make a list of complaints against the king saying that he is a tyrant or a ruler that rules with absolute power and he has overstepped those rules that John Locke said and he's overstepped and abused his power enough that we have the rights to break away. And the fourth and last part is a declaration of freedom where the delegates wrote that all 13 colonies should and ought to be free, meaning that they all agree to this and they are all together fighting together against the king. So all 13 colonies are fighting unitedly to be free. Now the declaration is adopted on July 2nd. It is read to the public on July 4th. July 2nd, the group inside the delegates adopt the written version, the final version. Uh, it is read out in the city streets on July 4th. That is why we celebrate Independence Day. And we have lots of fireworks. Now, if your fireworks sound like explosions, that's probably bad. But that's all I got. I'm on a limited budget. Um, now, this declaration, after it's read on July 4th, the delegates still have to sign it to make it official. And all but one of the delegates have finally signed it by August 2nd. And that's when it's shipped around. Now, on July 4th and after July 4th, it is sent all around the world to other countries to show us to show the countries that we're ready for help to show the king this is it this is the breakup letter you've wanted so girls think about it when you write a breakup letter to a boy you basically start with you know hey look it's over that's number one uh you know here's why we're breaking up you know it, it it's things i need to deal with it's it's not you it's me you know there's things i'm going with that would be the second part on uh, number three would be the reasons why you don't like the boy anymore maybe he's kind of ugly or he doesn't treat you right or buy you stuff and then last it's over deal with it uh, by the way you can insert your own breakup music right there uh, the letter C says the importance of the declaration why is this important it it elevates the struggle for independence so now not just Boston and Massachusetts are fighting this war all 13 are this breakup letter shows that all 13 colonies are not part of it they're all fighting in this together and the colonists now have everything to lose everything they want their independence their freedom they're fighting for uh, number two, by publishing the declaration, we're allowing other countries to help us. We're showing them that we should be free and we think we're free and now we need help. And then uh, number three is that the colonists, because we deem ourselves independent and our own country, we can steal land and property from the loyalists. And loyalists are, of course, the people loyal to the king, whereas patriots are the people that are for the independence movement. Now, as the war breaks out, this being the last slide of your notes. As the war breaks out, we always look at who should win on paper. There is the flag, the unadopted flag of the Americas, or at least the American country. You have the 13 stars in a row, and you have the 13 stripes, and then you have the English flag as well. <laughs> Sorry if you're English and watching. But good for you if you are. Uh, now, for the colonial sides, their advantages are that we have a good general in George Washington. He's well respected. The English respect him as a leader. The Americans know and love him as a leader. But on paper, he has lost more than he want, than he's won, which represents most of the Browns coaches. But we still love the Browns. Uh, number two, the colonists know the land. We're fighting here in America. They know the land. They know where to go. They're ready for this. So this is an area where they know the land. They're going to use that to their advantage. The British are not used to that. Number three is that Britain's 3,000 miles away. It will take a lot of effort and time to get more soldiers, more supplies for the British Army, whereas the Americans are fighting here. And then last but not least, they are fighting. The Americans are fighting for everything. They are fighting for their own freedom and independence. They have everything to lose when you look at it that way. And now for the British, the English advantages. They have a huge army and navy, one of the largest in the world. They are going to be bringing over 50,000 troops total throughout this war. They have the largest navy as well, whereas the Americans have like a few little tiny boats with nothing. But again, this is America. Okay, uh, moving on. Number two is that the British have more money, more supplies, and more people which is an 
awesome advantage to have over the Americans. If you look at number two, that's one of the reasons they should easily win, given the fact they have more money, more supplies, and more people. Uh, number three is that a third of the colonists are still loyal to the king, and a third of those people, or a third of the colonists, may actually help the loyalists or help the British fight. They may also kind of sell out their own people or their own colonists, their own patriot colonists 